Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. All right, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, the passage that we just read a few minutes ago. Uh, we're actually going to begin in verse 21, uh, but we will get to verse 24 uh, in this teaching of Jesus. Uh, we're beginning a new series called With Our Whole Hearts. Uh, and we're going to, over the next six weeks, uh, look at what, it, what does it look like to follow Jesus, uh, to practice the way of Jesus in the world that we find ourselves in uh, with our whole hearts, with every part of us. Uh, as we sang, we tend to have divided hearts, but Jesus invites us to have a united heart uh, for him and in trust of him. So we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 7, uh, beginning with verse 21. Uh, now, I don't know if uh, you heard this uh, scandal from a couple weeks ago. I know there's lots of scandals that come on your news feed. Uh, this didn't have to do with politics. It didn't have to do with a celebrity pastor. It had to do with tidying up. Uh, Marie Kondo uh, announced that she no longer practices her own teaching. Uh, she, she, in her recent book, uh, said that she now has three children and so she has begun to discover that tidying up gets more difficult the more kids that you have. Uh, now this prompted a whole kind of interesting conversation on social media, as you can imagine. Some people felt vindicated that, yes, I was right, I wasn't crazy. Uh, other people felt gypped. They felt like they had done the work that she called them to, had tried to fold the clothes the way that she taught them to, and now she herself was quitting. Now, I'm not here to down on Marie Kondo. I still fold my shirts the way that she taught us to in the life-changing art of tidying up. But what was interesting is uh, as she talked about this, uh, she didn't just talk about it as uh, here's how you clean or here's how you tidy. Uh, she uses this Japanese word karashi, which means a way of life. Uh, that what she was offering us, what she was inviting us into was not just tidy, but a whole way of life that would lead, as she saw it, to joy. But she began to experience what most of us experience anytime we try to lean into something or try to get better at something or try to grow in something, is that busyness, stress, and hurry tend to get in the way. That you might have all the best intentions in the world to live a particular kind of way or practice a particular kind of thing, but kids always have demands. My job is always knocking at the door. And so what happens is what happened to her, is that we kind of reach this point where like, well, that was a really good idea, but I guess it's just not for me. You see, as I read this, I had sympathy for her because I think uh, if we're honest, that's how most of us feel about what it means to follow Jesus. It's a really nice idea I'll read the book, and I'll put a few things into practice, but for the most part, it feels like, if I'm honest, following Jesus, I, life is too busy for it, it's too difficult, uh, I don't quite have what it takes to do that. And so what we do then is, as all these aspirations we have to follow Jesus, right? Maybe you started this year and said, I'm going to read the Bible in a year. Uh, and it's now that point where you're like in Leviticus, and it's really confusing, you're like, no, I'm out. We have great aspirations or intent to follow Jesus, but the busyness of our lives, the stress of our family life, the finances all seem to push in and crunch in on us. And pretty soon, if we're not careful, following Jesus gets put on the shelf with Marie Kondo and all of our past New Year's resolutions. And one of the ways I think we cope with this is we tend to make following Jesus then primarily about ideas. Uh, it's about my thoughts that I have about Jesus. Uh, the ideas that I have about Jesus, the theology that I have about Jesus, the beliefs that I have about Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what then tends to happen is when we leave Jesus to the realm of my ideas or my beliefs, I can claim to follow Jesus, but my life can look nothing like him. 
And so we'll have lots of people that will claim to follow Jesus, but then when things really start to come out, you start to realize, oh, they don't really have much character. They don't actually live into or lean into the things of Jesus. They have kind of a Christian stamp on them, but their life doesn't look any different from anyone else who believes any other system except for maybe the fact that they go to church on Sunday morning. And so people will look in and say, I don't know if that's what it means to follow Jesus. I'm not sure that I want to be a part of that. Now, here's the thing, though. When we leave Jesus to the realm of ideas, we're just free to live however we want, as long as I come to church on Sunday morning. Uh, Eugene Peterson, in his book, The Jesus Way, he, he talks about this reality, how we tend to kind of uh, put Jesus labels on things, but then just be very, very pragmatic with our life, live however we want, do it however we want, use whatever strategy we want. He says this, the Jesus way, wedded to the Jesus truth, brings about the Jesus life. We can't proclaim the Jesus truth, but then do it any old way we like. Nor can we follow the Jesus way without speaking the Jesus Truth. We cannot skip the way of Jesus in our hurry to get to the truth of Jesus as he is worshipped and proclaimed. The way of Jesus is the way that we practice and come to understand the truth of Jesus, living Jesus in our homes and workplaces with our friends and family. You see, what he's saying is that Jesus did not just come to introduce us to a set of ideas about who he is. He came to show us how to live. And that as we follow his way of living... It will lead to the life that God always intended for us, the life of freedom and wholeness that Jesus seemed to be marked by so much. But if we just jettison the truth of Jesus and just do whatever whatever he does, we're missing out on that thing too. You see, John 1 tells us the word Jesus became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, that he invites us into a way of life that is rooted in a deep truth of who he is that then leads to the freedom and the wholeness that God always intended for you in your life. And that's what we're going to explore over the next several weeks, is what does it actually look like to not just have ideas about Jesus, but to live the Jesus life, to live life as Jesus lived, and to follow him literally. Follow me when he invited his disciples. It was not just follow me to a Bible study or follow me to a classroom. It was follow me in life. And as I do this, it will lead to the life that Jesus wants for me. And so we're going to do this uh, for our community through something that we're calling a rule of life. I'm going to explain what that means in just a second. But today we're going to look at kind of the first P of this rule of life. There's six P's that we're going to talk about. But the first P is practice. Is practice, which is the very thing that Jesus is talking about in this teaching. Uh, That following Jesus is more than just having ideas about Jesus but it is seeking to embody the habits, values, and teachings of Jesus in our everyday lives. In other words, to see the truth of Jesus played out into how I live my life, the habits and practices of my life, how I approach the issues and challenges in my everyday. Now, in the Christian tradition, this has been called a rule of life. It's not rules for life, like do this and don't do that. Uh, The rule of life idea comes from a trellis, Uh, It's almost planting season, not quite planting season, but a trellis is that uh, metal fence that he put up around a tomato plant. The trellis gives it structure. The trellis is not the plant, but the trellis gives it some structure to hang on to. And so that's where early followers of Jesus adopted this idea that Jesus' way is not just about facts. It's about a way of life. So what does it look like to practice the things that Jesus practiced? to embrace the habits of Jesus, to experience the truth of who Jesus is. And so they developed uh, practices that marked their community. And so that's what we're looking at as a community over the next six weeks, is what does this look like for us? What does it look like for us to follow Jesus in this time, in this season, in this community, in ways that are distinct to who Jesus is? But here's the thing, whether or not you like that idea of a rule of life, I want you to realize that you already have one. You already have a rule of life, even if you don't realize it. Uh, Neurobiologists and brain researchers uh, have come to figure out that about somewhere between 50 to 95% of our decisions in a day are based on habits. So at least half of your life, maybe even all the way up to 95% of your life, your brain is functioning on autopilot. 
Like if you've ever left work, gotten in the car, and then all of a sudden you're in your driveway and you don't remember what happened, that's your brain on autopilot. Right? And some of this is the wisdom of how God has made our brains uh, to be efficient. Because if I had to actively make a decision every time a decision came my way, we would be paralyzed. I couldn't make that many decisions. And so our brain, through the wisdom of God, learns some regular routines and some regular habits. So if you've ever been washing the dishes and having a conversation at the same time, and all of a sudden the dishes are all washed and you had a great conversation, your brain is doing what it's supposed to do. But that also can mean that I might have habits or patterns of being that can lead me away from the things of Jesus. And so my brain has learned to function, my heart has learned to function in some particular habits or practices of life that maybe are not neutral, but maybe actually lead me away from Jesus. And so as we become aware of that, now the question is, okay, what do I do with that? Like, for example, anytime you feel a moment of boredom, you reach in your phone and you start scrolling through Instagram. That's a habit. Because there's something that I'm doing in response to this boredom or this loneliness. Uh, whenever you feel stress or maybe you feel pain, the, the habit that your brain has learned is to numb in some kind of way. And maybe numb in some, some maybe seemingly neutral ways, like binging on Netflix, even though that might not be neutral. Uh, but also maybe in some unhealthier or more dangerous ways, numbing with alcohol or drugs. And this is how we get stuck in cycles of addiction because my brain and my body kind of work alongside the thing that Jesus is doing or not doing in my life. And so I am prone to then habits that lead me away from Jesus. If you and your spouse are in kind of an awkward tiff, it's easier to binge on Netflix than it is to talk about the issues between the two of you. I react to my kids out of hurriedness and stress because the habit has told me I don't have time for this. You see, it's possible that you could have a rule of life, you could have a set of habits and practices in your life to respond to the issues and the tensions that you're facing that you might not even think about, but they're actually leading you away from the things of Jesus. This is what Thomas Keating in his book, Invitation to Love, described as our emotional programs for happiness. What he said is, we learn these ingrained ways of relating to ourselves, God, and others to find three things. To find security, to find affection, and to find control. We learn these very early on how to relate from our parents, our family of origin, but these are emotional programs for happiness that operate underneath our way of being that he says because of sin and because of brokenness and relationships actually lead us to relate to other people in sinful and broken ways. Because they give us something that we deeply need, but we learn to get them in unhealthy and unholy ways. And all this is running behind the scenes, behind the screen of your active decision-making throughout your day. And so when Jesus says, follow me, he is inviting us into a new way of life. He is inviting us to put off the old self, as Paul would say, to put off the old habits, the old practices, with the ways that sin and brokenness has distorted them and leading us into a way that leads to what Jesus said was an abundant life, a life of wholeness, a life of trust, and a life of freedom. And this is what he invites us into, to practice his way of life and to find in it the freedom and wholeness that God wants for you and me. This is where we then find ourselves in the text in Matthew. So I want to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 21. Because I think it's important for us to get uh, where Jesus begins with this. Because if we're not careful, it could sound like I'm offering you the alternative to Marie Kondo's life-changing art of tidying up. But that's not how Jesus starts his practice. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, notice this. Uh, these, whoever these people are standing before Jesus, 
And they're saying, Jesus, look at all the things that we did. Now, if you look through that list, that's an impressive list. Like if I encountered someone who said, hey, here's a word of prophecy. If I encountered someone who said, hey, I cast out a demon yesterday. If I encountered someone who said, I performed a miracle in the name of Jesus, I'd be like, okay, you're going to probably be a few steps ahead of me in the line to heaven. But Jesus says, like, and they're even adamant. They say, in your name, in your name, in your name. Right? They, they think that they're doing these things in the name of Jesus. But Jesus says in verse 23, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You see, the beginning point for the way of Jesus is not doing things for Jesus. It's not adopting the practices of Jesus. Now, that sounds like I'm contradicting myself in this whole sermon, but Jesus is very clear. We don't begin with doing things for him. Instead, we begin with knowing him. All right, the beginning point of a life of discipleship is not adding new practices or adding new habits or going to church or reading the Bible or doing all these religious or spiritual things because these people did those things and yet they find themselves before Jesus and Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, the beginning point of a life following Jesus is knowing him. And how do I know him? The first thing that Jesus said in Mark's gospel, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. In other words, what he's saying, you need to make a decision to turn from your old ways and to say yes and trust in Jesus and his way. And that Jesus offers you a new start, a new beginning, a new life through his death and resurrection. And that is the beginning point of the life of discipleship. So if you come into this and say, great, tell me the new things that I'm supposed to do. Tell me the new religious activity I'm supposed to do. But you do not know Jesus. You're missing it. You see, Jesus is very clear that his life of discipleship begins with being rather than doing. It begins with being in relationship with him, being in his love, being in his family through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And so this challenges our tendency to rush in and say, give me more spiritual activity. Give me more new things to do. Give me the best strategy for reading the Bible. Give me the best habits that I need to adopt in order to follow Jesus. Jesus says, first... Do you know me? Have you trusted in my love? Do you have a relationship with me? And so if you rush into this and say, I'm going to practice the things of Jesus, but you don't know him deeply, you're missing it. But Jesus then says in verse 24, everyone who then hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. See, so on the one hand, Jesus challenges our tendency to associate following Jesus with our spiritual and our religious activity. He says, first, be with me. First, rest in what I have done for you. And then, from that place, build a life of practice. He says this, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Or as the King James put it, it was utterly destroyed. You see, what Jesus is saying is that when you know him, or when you are with him, in relationship with him, when you know his love, you are then invited to build a life on that love. The rock that Jesus refers to, it, that rock seems to be directly connected to his words and his life. And this comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous teaching about how to live life in the kingdom of God. The rock is Jesus and his way. Jesus and his teachings. He says, this rock... That song we just sang, this rock is the same rock that Moses stood on, the same rock that Peter stood on, the the firm foundation of the faithful love of God. This rock will not move. This rock will not change. It is worth building your life on this. You see, what we tend to do is build our lives on the sand. Like Thomas Keating and his emotional programs for happiness, we tend to build our sense of happiness or wholeness or joy or or whatever on our circumstances. But how often do your circumstances change? 
I tend to build it on people's approval of me, but people, they, they change their approval of me. I tend to build it on uh, what the latest trend or latest fad is, but that changes all the time. You see, we are so prone to build our lives on these things that are constantly changing because we think that in them we'll find love, in them we'll find wholeness, in them we'll find the life that we've been looking for. But Jesus says these things are always unstable. And if you build your lives on things that are unstable, it is eventually going to fall apart. But instead, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now notice, both people experience storms. Right? Both people experience this whirlwind, but the difference is that the guy who built his house on the rock, his house stood, notice, not because of how well he built the house, it stood because it was founded on the rock. And because of that foundation on the rock, on the love and the teachings of Jesus, when life came at him, he was secure because he has built his life on Jesus. This is what Paul says in Colossians 2. He says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives, or that word could also be translated, walk in him, rooted and built up in him. You see, whatever you root your life in, wherever you find nourishment, wherever you find love, wherever you find approval, wherever you find security, is going to shape your life. Right? Just like you put a plant, you know, you know that old science trick where you put like a white daisy in a cup with like colored water and it begins to change color. That's what Jesus is saying. Whatever you build your life on is going to shape how your life looks. But we are invited to build our life on the love and the teachings of Jesus. Jesus even went so far to say this in John 14, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Right? So if we believe in Jesus, we will do the things that he did. He even said this, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. That when we build our life on Jesus and practice his way, it leads to a life that looks like him. So this is not just about adopting a new set of ideas and then living however we want. It's saying if Jesus came to free us and to show us how to live, then I should shape my life on him. I should shape my patterns and my habits and my approaches to the issues that I'm facing on him and his life. And this is fundamentally what it means to be a disciple. The word disciple gets very churchy. It really means a student or an apprentice. And if you apprentice with someone, you're watching a master work. And you're trying to learn the tricks of the trade, the, 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 the way that they did it, so that you can then go do it in your life. And that is what it means to be a disciple, to follow Jesus, or as Paul would say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so we begin this series talking about practice, because practice is the invitation to embrace the life that Jesus lived. And to say, if I trust in the love of Jesus and I, I believe that he has my best in mind, then the things that he taught us of how to live, I should try to put those things to work in my life. This is what in the Christian tradition has become known as spiritual disciplines. Uh, but spiritual disciplines sound very spiritual, right? They sound like things for super spiritual people. They're like things for monks or pastors to do. But Richard Foster, in his book on spiritual disciplines, he said this, we must not be led to believe that the disciplines are only for spiritual giants and hence beyond our reach, or only for contemplative, contemplatives who devote all their time to prayer and meditation. Far from it. God intends the disciplines of the spiritual life to be for ordinary human beings, people who have jobs, who care for children, who wash dishes and mow lawns. In fact, the disciplines or the practices are best exercised in the midst of our relationships with our husband or wife our brothers and sisters, our friends and neighbors. Neither should we think of the spiritual disciplines as some dull drudgery aimed at exterminating laughter from the face of the earth. Joy is the keynote of all the disciplines. The purpose of the disciplines is liberation from the stifling slavery to self-interest and fear. Catch that last line. You see, as long as your foundation is insecure... As you are building your life on the sand, whether that's the approval of other people, the approval of your spouse, uh, the success of your job, whatever that thing is that you are building your life on, because it is inherently unstable, you will constantly have to live in some degree of fear or uncertainty. 
You have to live in some degree of this could be taken away from me, and so you become very self-interested. You become very self-focused and self-motivated because at any moment this could be taken away from me. But if Jesus' love is a rock that is faithful, and if his character never changes, then I am then free to build a life that is not rooted in fear or self-interest, but that is rooted in giving, that is rooted in generosity, that is rooted in freedom. Why? Because my foundation is secure, and so I have nothing to worry about. This is how Jesus leads us into life. And so this is at the heart of what it means to practice, is to practice the things that Jesus did so that I can begin to experience and grow in the life and love that he has for me. So I just want to offer, just for a few moments, how practice works. As we talk about this over the next five weeks, we're going to talk about different practices from the life of Jesus. But I think it's really important for us to get how practice works. And the Bible is very clear on this, particularly in one passage. So I want to invite you to flip over to Philippians chapter 2. Because I think this is really important for us to get. Because if we miss this, we can really quickly, because this is how we are, rush into, I need to do, the, I need to do all these things, and miss how God actually changes us. And so Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 12. This comes on the heels of Paul's great hymn on how Jesus died and rose again. And the very next thing he says is, therefore, in other words, because of this, here's what we do. As you have always obeyed, verse 12, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's two dynamics that Paul is going to introduce us to. The first is this, that when I practice, I am working out my salvation with fear and trembling. Now, a couple words that Paul uses there. The word salvation, right? We tend to think salvation is I I pray to confess my sins, to receive the free gift of salvation. That is the beginning of what salvation means. But salvation really is all of the new life that Jesus has for me. That he has saved me, he is saving me, and will continue to save me until I get to heaven. And so salvation is not just I need to now work to make sure that that prayer that I prayed when I was eight worked. It is instead that new life that Jesus brings me. And so he is saying, I work out. Now that work out, in, that the root of that word in Greek is exercise, or I perform. Right? Some of you guys go to the gym and, and you exercise. Right? You, do the, you do the reps. You run the race. You do the things because that makes you a healthier person. And so this word work out is this word of exercise or perform or practice. So in other words, what he is saying is, is I, my part in this is I practice my way into the new life that Jesus has for me. So the freedom that he has for me, I practice my way into that. I exercise what that looks like in my everyday life. I put it into practice in my habits and my disciplines. But notice that he says, I do this with fear and trembling. In other words, this, doesn't, this isn't to become a master of this. That somehow, yes, I've finally made it. Yes, I've finally done it. No, fear and trembling, that could also mean awe and wonder. Right? That as I practice the discipline, as I practice the thing of Jesus, there's an awe and wonder to it that I am invited into this new life. That this new life that Jesus won for me is now available to me. And so it's not that I master it. I master it, but that it masters me. That as I work out my salvation, I begin to be worked out by my salvation. So now that there are places in my heart and places in my life that that I was resistant to, that now Jesus is bringing new freedom into. And so that idea of working out my salvation, what does that look like? Paul says that's obedience. That's being obedient to the life of Jesus. And as I do this, here's the second dynamic that happens. Paul says in verse 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so as I work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, God works in me to change me. He is actively working in me. This is uh, the truth of the presence of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says, I'm going to the Father, what he's saying is going to send my spirit. And so if you are a, a follower of Jesus, God's spirit resides in you, And so as I am working out, there is another power that is working out me. 
that is beginning to change and transform who I am from the inside out. Notice there's two places in which we are transformed. The first is my will. My will. My will is the seat of my desires. Right? This is like when rubber meets the, the road, am I going to do this or am I not going to do this? Right? The will is the place where I make decisions. And so the first place that God's Spirit begins to work me out is by challenging and changing my will. Uh, this is why if you were with us on Wednesday night, we talked about what Ronald Rolheiser called the pleasure principle, which is our default tendency to choose comfort, convenience, and control. That I, in my own life, left to myself, my will, if I'm going to make a decision, I'm going to choose comfort, control, or convenience. But notice that as God works in me, I'm going to find myself less in control. He's going to be more in control. He might want to challenge some of the ways that I seek comfort that push me away from the things of Jesus. He might confront me with my will. Because if God wants to be in charge, but I'm in charge, at some point there's going to be a little bit of a showdown. This is why in our rule of life diagram, there's this dotted line right across that intellect box. If you remember this, the spies are, when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's socially, physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. Those are those five letters there. Uh, the I is that intellect, my thoughts about Jesus. And, and, and those, if I'm not careful, can become a barrier to Jesus doing this work of transforming my will. Why? Because my will tends to rest in my emotional and my spiritual life. But what Paul is saying is that as I practice the way of Jesus, God's Spirit is going to confront me there at the level of my will. And so I have to make a decision at that point. Am I going to allow God to lead me? Am I going to allow him to confront me? Am I going to allow him control in this area where I would rather not give him control? And this is why, like, sometimes when you practice the way of Jesus or you practice spiritual disciplines, sometimes it feels like there's nothing happening at all. Why? Because God is doing a work in me. And maybe I can't see the evidence of it. Maybe it just feels like, all right, another day, opening up the Bible, what is this going to say? God is still working, even if I don't feel like it. Why? Because he is working to change and transform my will. Howard Thurman put it this way in his book on spiritual disciplines. He says, God is immediately available to us if the door is open to him. The door is opened by yielding to him that nerve center where we feel consent or the withholding of it most centrally. In other words, that place where I have to decide at the deepest level of who I am. Am I going to say yes to God or not? And he calls it a nerve center, which means it's going to be a sensitive place. Thus, if a man makes his deliberate self-conscious intention the offering to God of his central consent and obedience, then he becomes energized by the living spirit of the living God. So God wants to do this work at our will so that we would begin to desire the things that God wants us to desire. And the result will be then what Paul says also happens is my actions begin to change. My will is changed, and so therefore my actions, he says, to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, that as he changes my will, it will lead to a change in my actions. But God first wants to do this work within me. And this is how practice works. As I practice or work out the way of Jesus, God is working in me, which means that it is never me accomplishing on my own what God wants for me, that God is always working in me to make me more like him. I mean, how good is God to do that? Right? That he's not like, hey, go do these things and I'll check in on you in like six months. No, he's like, I'm going to help you do these things because I want you so much but I want you to want me. And so I'm going to show you how to get there. This is how practice works. Now, this is where a rule of life comes in. Right? Because a rule of life is take, trying to take what is often unconscious and make it conscious. Right? All those habits that we tend to have, we're kind of an autopilot mode. And so a rule of life is what Pete Scazzaro defines this way, an intentional, conscious plan to keep God at the center of everything we do. It is doing our part of the equation to say, how do I work out the way of Jesus? How do I practice his way? And so we're going to explore this over the next couple weeks uh, around this circle of these six practices of the way of Jesus. 
Um, because this is really a template. Um, because each one of us is in a different season of life. We have different struggles. We have different personalities. And so uh, how you follow Jesus in this season, there's going to be some similarities to how I follow Jesus, but there's also going to be some differences. And so over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to look at how Jesus modeled each one of these practices and then offer some thoughts or some wisdom on what that could look like for you. But you're also then invited to say, what does this look like for me? How does Jesus want to challenge me in my will in particular? so that I am more open to the things that he wants to do in my life in this season. We're also along the way going to hear stories from people who have been practicing some of these things because we learn from one another in the context of community. And so I want to invite you to lean into this and to say, what would it look like for me to practice these things in my life right now? Because each one of these drawn from the life of Jesus will tend to both challenge us at our will, but also challenge the larger world around us and who Jesus is and what he's calling us to do. Uh, now, one last warning, uh, or one last thing, and we're going to say this over and over again. Okay, The purpose of practice is positioning myself to experience God's love, not performing to earn God's love. It is positioning myself to experience God's love. In other words, God's love is already there. God's love is already for you. It's already secure because of who Jesus is. And so I am simply saying yes to Jesus' invitation to experience it, to trust it, to build my life on the rock of his love. And so when I drift into, okay, I need to pray in order to get God to love me, or I need to practice Sabbath in order to get God to love me, I need to read the Bible in order to get God to love me, I have now missed out on what Jesus is actually inviting me into. And so I want to go back to that rule of life. You can go back to that rule of life. Here's how I want you to think about it. We do this from the inside out, not the outside in. All right, so this begins as I invite Jesus to lead me in my heart, in my life. And as a result of that, we do what Jesus says, we put it into practice. But when I come from the outside in to say, okay, I need to pray in order to get God to love me. I need to practice this in order to get God to love me. I've now missed out how God wants to work on me. So this is what we're going to look at over the next several weeks is how Jesus wants to lead us into freedom. How he wants to lead us into wholeness as we invite him to lead every part of us. So let me pray for us, and then we're going to enter into a time of confession and communion. God, you are so good that you don't leave us on our own. You love us too much to do that. You came and you offered your son to bring us life. So God, as we consider what it means to follow you, not just with our heads, but in our habits, Spirit, would you show us the ways in which you are inviting us into new life? Would you show us the ways in which we're resistant to your truth, we're resistant to the gospel, we're resistant to allowing you to lead us. Uh, God, for the one who's here this morning, and maybe they're new to the things of Jesus, uh, would you show them that this begins with your great love for us, that you offered your son for us so that we could rest on the foundation of his love and then build the life that he calls us to build. Jesus, thank you that you're good. Thank you that you offered yourself for us. May we live lives that reflect who you are. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.